We continue with my 2014 college previews, Big 12 style, my seventh ranked team in the Big 12. I think they'll finish seventh this year. Do I think they'll go to a bowl game? I'll let you know at the end of the show. We're talking about Texas Christian University, as you can see over my shoulder, TCU, the Horn Frogs from Fort Worth. You know, before TCU entered the Big 12 two years ago, um, they were in the Mountain West Conference, and yeah, they had to worry about Boise State, but um, pretty much conference wins, I don't think, um, were something that TCU thought was at a high premium because, you know, when before they joined the Big 12, you know, whether it was a Mountain West or different conferences they were playing in, um, conference wins for them were not that hard to get unless they played, like I said, a Boise State or maybe one other team from the respective conference they were in. Uh, really, the conference they were in, they owned. Big 12, they're finding out, is a much different ball game. And uh, last season, they played non-conference games and only won two of them. Overall record was 4-8, and eight, bowl ineligible. So Gary Patterson knows that entering this season, TCU offensively has to answer a lot of questions because I don't think I've seen a team on my previews that I've ever done in my life where the offense and defense, as far as overall quality, were so far apart. TCU's defense is damn good. Their offense is an absolute eyesore. It's terrible to watch. And what do you do when you have an offense that, by the way, only had 25 points a game a year ago? What do you do about an offense that only averaged 118 yards on the ground per game, which is 110th in the country? And what do you do when you have receivers that constantly run the wrong routes? And, by the way, blame the receivers, too, for not being able to hold on to passes. That was more of a common occurrence you might think of Fort Worth as well. What do you do when the team is not very well coached and not hitting their mark? Obviously, you make some changes on your coaching staff. And two offensive coordinators take over now for that offense. We're talking about um, Doug Meacham, who, by the way, coached a little bit at Oklahoma State. In fact, he was there for several seasons. Um, so Oklahoma State, they definitely know up-tempo offense. So does Texas Tech. And the other uh, offensive coordinator is Sonny Cumbie, who played his college football in Lubbock at Texas Tech. So you're bringing two guys that definitely know up-tempo offense, and maybe that's what TCU needs. question is, who's going to be the quarterback? Do they go with the incumbent? Uh, that's Trevon Boykin, um, who last season was inconsistent. Or do you go with uh, Matt Jokel, who only has one year of eligibility to go. He's a transfer out of uh, Texas A&M. Still, here we are in late August, and I have no idea. I've been trying to find out like crazy who they're going to go with at QB. And maybe they haven't announced the decision just yet. But it is a big decision for Gary Parrish because this is an offense that is going to be different than last year in terms of their style. Boykin, again, is the incumbent, but Jokel, they say, is a little more compatible, perhaps, for this new style offense. The ground game, we mentioned it. Uh, they were pathetic a year ago. Now we're going to see if uh, B.J. Catalan is the answer. We know special teams-wise, again, he will be returning kicks. He had that blazing 100-yard return last year in the opener against LSU. So we know the guy can, you know, take a big one at any time. So uh, you have Catalan in the backfield and also, to uh, Aaron Green complimenting him. It's a big reason why people at TCU country are more optimistic than last year because they do have two quality running backs that can take pressure off the QBs. But the QBs are going to have to make throws, and the receivers, again, are going to have to execute. So Josh Doxson, David Porter, and the guy that they're moving from running back to the wideout, uh, Jordan Moore, they hope to be those uh, receivers that can aid the uh, TCU offense. Some good news for TCU as far as the offensive line. you got a lot of players back, okay? Um, four of your six um, full-time starters from a year ago return, including the two tackles, along with the uh, center, uh, Joey Hunt, and the tight end is back as well. you got to replace the guards, but at least the outside is taken care of. Talking about TCU, we talked about their offense being bad. This is where TCU, though, Gets a little bit of balance. Their defense, just like their offense, 25 points per game. That's what TCU's defense allowed last season. One of the best averages in the country. And, by the way, they were terrific against the run, only giving up 130 yards a game. That was 21st best in the nation. We will see how TCU does as far as um, the secondary. We'll start with the secondary first because that, that's the true strength of this team. Four players are back out of five. They play a 4-2-5 alignment, five defensive backs, and you return Sam Carter, who's now the new leader of this team. He'll play a strong safety. The weak safety will be occupied by Chris Hackett. And at your um, one position that you really, really need help in at corner, 
we're going to see a uh, redshirt freshman. That's because Jason Barrett, All-American last year, first-team All-American, high draft pick by San Diego. Obviously, you're not going to be seeing him anymore. And he occupied the left side of the field that he protected very, very well. All quarterbacks had to respect where he was at all times. He was that good. So Barrett is a big absence for this team. Um, another absence for this team is going to be at defensive line. Um, Devontae Fields, who a couple years ago was actually the Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year, but um, he won't be back, okay? He's had some off-the-field issues, um, assault against his ex-girlfriend, and TCU finally had enough of him, and they've parted ways now. This could be a big loss, but then again, maybe it's a blessing for TCU. He only played a limited number of games last year, missed nine because of a, a severe foot injury. Um but also, too, was the uh, distractions off the field, too. Uh, so so maybe now that, that Fields is gone, you can move forward. Um, you do return. Um, you return only one defensive tackle. So maybe that defensive line can develop some chemistry now without him. Linebacking core, at least you don't have to worry about that area. That's solidified with uh, Jonathan Anderson as well as uh, Marcus Mallett. So eight defensive starters return to this team. And that's really, really going to help. Now, we mentioned earlier there was one guy who's not coming back on defense. That's Fields. The other guy that's not coming back is uh, Brandon Carter, who really would have helped out at a wide receiver, but he also, too, is no longer part of the team. So we're going to see if the improvement as far as um, what we're going to see is a different offense for TCU, the new coordinators, if that's what they need to get that offense chip started. And we'll see if the defense can keep up their fine play. The defense, I can't really fault them. Schedule for TCU, the three non-conference games, they're all winnable. Um, you know, Samford, S-A-M-F-O-R-D, not Stanford, but Samford, they open up the season with um, August 30th. Two weeks to prepare for Minnesota, the Golden Gophers, replacing some new bodies, but they did win nine games a year ago. That's also a home game. And then you play your hated rivals from Dallas, that's SMU. Um, that's the final non-conference game of the year the following week. Or I should say two weeks later. There are two bye weeks, by the way, come – very, very early in the season. They get two out of three bye weeks because, again, the uh, Big 12 doesn't have a conference game, so they get another bye week. Conference opener at home against Oklahoma. Might be a perfect time to kiss the Sooners because OU plays Texas the following week. Last two years, TCU has played Oklahoma very tough, losing within a score both years, including last year's three-point loss in Norman. Then you have to go to Baylor, the defending Big 12 champions, who TCU almost beat a year ago. Lost to them by three points as well. Then you host Oklahoma State, and a lot of people think that TCU could upset Texas Tech, that game in Fort Worth. And then you play three of your final five on the road at West Virginia, and there's also a game um, at home against Kansas State. You go to Kansas uh, by week, then you go to Texas, and I believe that game's on Thanksgiving, and then you close out the season at home against Iowa State. So the schedule, really, other than that Texas game, the final three games does ease up. Best case scenario, the defense will keep them in ball games and nip that up tempo offense for TCU's the answer. A six win season, I think, is within their reach and they can get to a bowl game. That's best case scenario, six and six. Worst case scenario, three and nine. Um, and that would mean simply that the offense uh, simply a spitter sputtering and um, the defense is having its problems too, uh, missing Barrett. And uh, we'll see how the secondary adapts without him. Again, they're, they're playing a uh, redshirt freshman in his place. So three and nine could happen. It's worst case likely scenario. I think TCU goes three and uh, six, seventh place in the Big 12, five and seven overall. I think they just miss out on qualifying for a bowl game. TCU again, defense is going to be the word. But until I see it for myself with my own eyes that TCU's offense can put points on the board and can be balanced. Right now, I can't drink the TCU Kool-Aid and say that they're getting back to a bowl game, at least not this season. That's my look at the Horned Frogs. Another preview coming up soon. Take care.